Well, can everyone hear me? Is it okay? I guess I'll apologize in advance. This, this may be a little bit boring compared to the uh, spirited performance we had before. Louder? Okay, sorry. It's not my thing. So I apologize. So I'm Dr. Jason Landry. This is Dr. Jacob Riggle. So we are both HIV specialists, and we have an HIV expert over here as well, Dr. Kim Tu Nguyen, doctor of pharmacy. She is one of the uh, scientists a research scientist with Gilead. And so I would like this really to be somewhat informal. These slides I sort of pilfered from all over the internet and other um, places where I get educational materials. And so I just kind of want to have them serve as basic points for us to think about, but really to involve you in the conversation as we go forward. So any questions or concerns would really be great. Uh, I don't like public speaking. So I don't usually ask questions uh, in, in public, so I would like some cards to be passed around. So if you have any questions, if you could just write them down, um, any of the three of us would be glad to, to answer it. And it doesn't have to be about aging, obviously. So Cam, too, and, and we can speak about advances in HIV treatment, what's coming down the pipe or the pike. I never know which word it is. Um, so. Without further ado, I guess we will begin. So um, basically, this is um, talking about aging well, living healthier, and living longer. How can we do that? A lot of things that we're going to cover today affect persons with HIV, but they also affect, affect people who do not have HIV. So I think it's really applicable to all of us uh, as Americans and as Americans living in the South, which I think you'll learn about as we go a little bit further into this. Um, so really, again, we just want to understand the causes. What are, what are the problems that lead to morbidity and mortality in persons living with HIV? And there are many, a myriad of things which we will go through. Sorry. Um, I'm just going to step back a little bit. Um, so this is the, these are the trends. So obviously we're looking at 1987 to 2017, 2018. Um, it takes a long time to get data, so it tends to lag behind. So our apologies. Uh, you can look at the age groups, 0 to 44. Um, so that's purple, yellow or orange, whatever color that is. And then um, 35 to 44. The, the deaths have decreased, thankfully, so they're going down. However, we're still having trouble with increase in death rates, 45 to 55 plus. And a variety of reasons for that, but probably one of the, the main reasons that we'll see is because of these other comorbid conditions. What else is a person living with that's adversely affecting them? Is it diabetes? Is it obesity? Is it depression? X, Y, and Z. All of the things that all of us as humans experience. So thankfully, though, this slide, as you see, and I hope it's clear, it may be a little small, deaths amongst persons diagnosed with HIV, people living with HIV, have declined. So these statistics overall are looking at 2010 to 2018. And as you'll see with the solid line, the total deaths have definitely decreased. So the death rate is dropping down. Persons that are experiencing HIV-related deaths are also decreasing, which is a good thing. So definitely making progress. Are we making as much progress as we need? No. But we will get to that. And then the dashed line, the bit of the longer dashes, are uh, deaths due to non-HIV-related deaths, which takes us into this other risk reduction that we'll get to. So these are some of the common comorbidities uh, in HIV infection, which is no different from, from anyone not living with HIV. So to kind of go through them, uh, mental health issues, whether it's major depression, bipolar disorder, alcohol use, tobacco usage, um, other recreational drugs, human papillomavirus, which we classically just abbreviate as HPV, uh, the hepatitis, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, in terms of viral hepatitis, syphilis, other sexually transmitted infections. Unfortunately, we as a state, Louisiana, still lead most of the nation with newly diagnosed cases of gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis, and children born with syphilis. 
Tuberculosis is not as big of a problem in the United States compared to worldwide. Worldwide, tuberculosis still is the number one killer in terms of infectious diseases that people have to experience. Uh, and then the rest are just kind of your run-of-the-mill things that all of us have to contend with, uh, both at a younger age and at an older age. So whether it's problems with cholesterol, problems with diabetes, whether it's type 1 or type 2, high blood pressure, coronary artery disease, bone loss, and then non-AIDS associated cancers. And if there are any questions as we go, please feel free to stop me. Um, this slide is a little bit busy and really I would just wanted to illustrate or use it for the top two lines. Um, so this is looking at improvements in life expectancy. And so the dot, as you'll see, is without HIV infection, total years in the triangle, or those persons living with HIV, their total years. And so when we look at back at 2000, 2003, we have a really wide gap. And we are narrowing that gap, which is a good thing, the closer that we get to 2014, 2016. Um, I don't know if we have a whole lot of data since then, closer to 2016. Um, government collection takes time and it's not published right away, unfortunately. So pretty much that's the take home point in this slide is that we are making progress. Persons living with HIV are living just as long, almost, as persons without. Right now we're looking at a five to seven year difference. Depending upon what studies you read, some people may say 10, but uh, that's kind of the take home point for this. Uh, we have a question in the chat. Yes. Is sarcopenia common with aging, uh, with aging with HIV? Sarcopenia? Sarcopenia. Probably. Yes, yes. Um, it, it, it is, it's common with everyone, so sorry, uh, like with muscle, yeah. muscle loss they're referring to? Muscle wasting? So um, sarco usually refers to muscles. And so yes, we do have muscle wasting as we all age. So it's very difficult for the human body, age 40 and on, to really build up muscle mass, which is uh, kind of what um, Dr. Rickle specializes in many things. And we can, we can talk about that a little bit more um, outside of what I do. So I have to plead ignorance on that. But we could either address that now or later, whatever you would prefer. That's okay. Uh, to the questioner, wherever they are, virtually, I suppose. Um, yes, sarcopenia is common in all aging people, not all aging people, aging people specifically who are moving less, and I'd say that's a big problem, uh, uh, especially if they don't have access to proper resources, especially nutritional resources, and that's another thing I was going to mention at the end, but um, yes, in the HIV positive community, Muscle wasting is a problem. It's very complicated. It could depend on their medica medication history. It could depend on other comorbidities. But at the end of the day, yes, uh, sarcopenia, which is muscle wasting, can happen. There are medications to assist with uh, preventing that wasting. It's usually related to hormones or growth hormones. Um, insurance usually covers them. Uh, so I would say just talk to your primary care provider or reach out to me and I'll be happy to answer any questions specifically about their needs for that. Can you build muscle back? It's a great question. Yes, mostly. Uh, again, it kind of depends on why they lost the muscle to begin with. And it may, if it's like really complicated related to hormones or medications, maybe there's medication changes that could happen. Maybe there's hormone supplementation that might be needed. Um, Nutritional deficiencies, like I explained, like if people just don't have adequate protein intake, that could be an easy thing to correct. Uh, still, as one ages, there will inevitably be some muscle loss. Uh, so we haven't been able to find that time machine just yet. But certainly ways to slow down the loss of muscle wasting. But like I said, it, depending on why they had the muscle wasting to begin with, there may be ways to stop it or reverse it. It just kind of depends on why they had it to begin with. Oh, my Lord. Hey. Great question. So general, there's a possibility that is an AIDS-related death. However, that's much, much 
less likely now. And so what we're dealing with, and maybe some of the other slides will illustrate that a little bit better, is that it is more so related to all of the other health problems that we all have as individuals, the chronic kidney disease, liver disease, so on and so forth. So it's a great question. Um, when, when people are newly diagnosed and they come to us at the level of AIDS, and so just to review for anyone who, who is not familiar, so a CD4 count of less than 200 or some AIDS-defining illness, um, candidiasis, thrush in the mouth, we would call AIDS. Um, generally speaking, most of our clients can have a CD4 count of 300, 400, 1,000. And so some people come to us with a CD4 count of zero. Nothing there. And it's perfectly fine. With the drugs that we have today, we go ahead and we start the medications. And I would say 90% of, of our clients, by week 12, they're undetectable and they're well on their way to rebuilding their immune system. And we do have certain families of drugs. Um, the integrase strand transfer inhibitors, which really do a stupendous job of boosting up that, inflama that inflammation. Uh, this talk is also a lot about inflammation, I apologize. And so boosting up that immune system, which is extremely important in what you're asking. When we have very, very low periods of immune system that can't take care of things, it increases the risk of long-term problems such as lung cancer and other cancers. So a great question, but I guess to uh, just summarize that in a little bit of a shorter way, most of these are non-AIDS related deaths. Did that answer your question? Okay. Okay. Um, and so this is uh, kind of touching upon what you just asked. Looking at the, the morbidity, uh, the incidence of comorbidities in, in persons uh, with and without HIV, um, the mortality rather of, of deaths. And so when you look at the, the graph, basically I just wanted to walk away Blue is without HIV, and this orange, yellow, what other color is, is um, excuse me, the blue is with, and the, the other color, color is without. Uh, and you can see that the, the death rates are lower in persons without. Um, I, I think the biggest thing to take away is the second bar graph from the left with any comorbidity. So when you pair any comorbidity, liver disease, kidney disease, lung disease, diabetes, cancer, cardiovascular, obesity, depression, whatever it may be, when you add that onto HIV, the mortality goes up for a variety of reasons which, which we can get into. Um, these, the next couple of slides are really just looking at, well, where are the problems in the United States? What are we dealing with? Um, all of these slides, keep in mind as we go forward, you can superimpose them one upon the other and they look the same. I did not put the HIV rates. Um, I was trying to put things in the presentation this morning and my computer was not cooperating with me. But it looks just like this. Um, so this is heart disease in the United States. I'm not certain which, oh, there we go, 2018 to 2020, and it doesn't change a whole lot. People of the South carry the burden of these diseases. People of color carry the burden of these diseases. Women carry the burden of these diseases. Uh, Hispanics carry the burden of these diseases. So it's a huge problem. How do we fix it? I don't have the answers to all that, but we do feel in our small way we're here to try to help out with these things. One out of every four people in the United States die of coronary artery disease. One out of every four, leading cause of death, and you see where it's happening. And so what can we do to decrease coronary artery disease? There are lots of things that we can do, lots of, of methods. This is one of the slides, I apologize, it's not centered. I just tried to add it on. This is something called a calcium score. I don't know if anyone has had a calcium score or is familiar with a calcium score. A show of hand if anyone no yes a few very good excellent so <clears throat> what a calcium score is it's a ct scan it's a low dose ct so there's not a lot of radiation it takes a couple of minutes to perform and what we're looking for is calcium which will show up as white and so when you look at the left and right is hard for me so when you're looking at the top left at that picture you'll see cac score equals zero there is no white in that gray blob. You do see some white at the very bottom, that's the vertebra, that's the backbone, and you do see some white at the top, those are just the ribs. But in that gray mass, which is the heart, there is no white. 
And again, the white represents calcium, and calcium represents plaque. And so as we proceed to the immediate right, calcium score of 29, you can start. Do we have any pointers? Laser? No? No worries. You mind if I walk in front of the screen? Anyway, so you'll see the little speck of white up there. We're starting to develop some cal You got it? There he is. Vanna White, ladies and gentlemen. So a calcium score of 29. To, to give you some ideas about numbers, all these numbers, 400 is usually considered a cutoff for being worrisome. And then so as you progress, this individual is starting, oh yes, I forgot, this individual is starting to develop more coronary artery disease. You can really see it lighting up. And in the last quadrant, you can really see all of the plaque that is forming. And most times plaque formation is asymptomatic, meaning it, you don't feel it, you don't know that it's there. People think, oh, I'm not having chest pain, it's not going into my arm, it's not going to my neck, I must not have any problems. Not the case. It is a silent killer. So 1,200, really high score, you can see all of the plaque. I strongly recommend these types of tests for being screened because people living with HIV have an increased risk of cardiovascular disease than do the regular popul the general population. Um, you can really see how thick this ring is here in the aorta. Just really, really dense, lots of calcium. But we can go to the next one, I think. There are two types of, of, of blockage or of plaque. So we have a soft plaque and we have a hard plaque. And that hard plaque, this is a terrible slide, I'm sorry. We can go to the next one. Uh, it kind of just goes into, I guess, calcified, mixed, and non-calcified. The non-calcified, which are the soft plaques, can be really, really problematic. They can be very dangerous. The hard plaques, which are calcified, if you just kind of imagine it's like a tin roof on the top of it, so it's very, very dense. It's a fibrin cap, and so it's not quite so bad. But those soft ones, those soft ones can become very inflamed. Let's go to the next one in here. And they become very inflamed. And they can crack open like the road or the ground when we don't have a whole lot of water, a lot of rain, it just splits open. Same things happen in these nice soft plaques, which are here, which is why we tend to take aspirin or Plavix, different medicines, to prevent those platelets, that's little red cells that you see. Once that splits open, those cells start to stick together and they clump and they form a clot and that's when someone has an active heart attack. And so, yes. 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 Very good question. And so some of them occur on the outside of the artery. Some of them occur on the inside. So they can be different places. Um, so what do we do to find out? Do we have this? Because we want to know if we have it. Because what we want to do then is to be very aggressive to prevent it from getting worse and also then to make it smaller. So we can shrink these plaques in some patients. Uh, we use cholesterol drugs. I am a huge proponent of cholesterol drugs, not in everyone. I am a shared, shared, a shared decision making, sorry, type of a person. So I give you the recommendation of what we can do to best treat you. And if that works for you, we do it. If not, we find a middle ground. Uh, I like patients to be involved in their care because I'm just the, the coach, if you will, and it's you. We need to do what's right for you. Um, in this country, unfortunately, while we're talking about studies, um, people of color seem to be, for some reason, not or not treated aggressively. Um, they're either not offered statins, or they're not offered the correct dosage of statins, or the correct statin to prevent this from happening. Just food for thought as you have questions. Yes. Say again. The natural way to do it? Good question. So I'm not extremely well trained in natural methods, but one thing that we do use is red yeast rice. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Red yeast rice, uh, it has the same type of active ingredient as statins. There was a recent study I was looking at. Um, I didn't get to read it to see if it was a good study or a bad study. Manganese, for example. But anything that we can also do to decrease inflammation, aspirin would help you know, those things to stop sticking. It wouldn't prevent the problem. Um, we will be getting into some natural things, though, in terms of diet and exercise, and I think Jake can probably comment on that. Um, this was a study that I just wanted to mention. I think it's worth looking at and reading some news articles, if you want to take a picture, called the Reprieve Study. 
And Reprieve is looking at cholesterol medications to decrease the risk of death in persons living with HIV. And it was a 35% reduction with this one particular generic, uh, Pitavast, and however you want to pronounce it. Uh, Livolo is one of the name brands. Now, the reason why that one was chosen is because it doesn't interact with anyone's HIV regimen. So it's very, very safe for people to take. We, we know that it can shrink some of those soft plaques uh, that we mentioned. So it can definitely do that. We've known that for quite some time in terms of resuvastatin, which is the generic for Crestor, can shrink plaques, Lipitor uh, can also shrink plaques. So where I was going when I said earlier, we want to really be recommended certain drugs to shrink these plaques, Crestor, Lipitor, Pitavastin, and also to treat it aggressively. You want to use the appropriate strength, Crestor, 20 or 40 milligrams, Lipitor, 40 or 80 milligrams, so on and so forth. So did that answer your question? And we'll have a little bit more about that in a bit. So just a very impressive study, relatively new. And CAM2 can speak about that more so if needed. And then we'll go to the next one. Um, again, back to our maps, stroke. So if you think about cardiovascular disease and cerebrovascular disease, it's, it's usually, it's plaque formation. There's something going on in the arteries. There's lots of inflammation. One thing that I did not mention is that these cholesterol medicines also decrease inflammation. So they decrease inflammation in the body, which leads to a whole host of other issues. Uh, now, one thing to answer your question about inflammation, perhaps, in natural measures, there was a recent study that came out looking at ginger, ginger supplements for connective tissue diseases, rheumatoid arthritis. And all of these things, to be honest with you, are all interconnected. We're, we're not an isolation of our parts and our spirit or anything else. Same thing goes for our medical problems. In turmeric, turmeric also may have some benefit for decreasing inflammation. And fish oil, fish oil, specifically rheumatoid arthritis, really great for helping to decrease that and improve. Um, but again, this was just an illustration, not a whole lot to take away, except that we, if you're from this area, terribly high risk for a stroke compared to the rest of the country. And then the next slide is chronic kidney disease. This one looks a little bit better. Looks like kind of the whole United States is equally negatively affected. But we um, here in this region, particularly affected by chronic kidney disease, I find strikingly my uh, patients of color are heavily burdened by chronic kidney disease, whether it's stage three, stage four, stage five, uh, requiring dialysis or not also transplant services. So one thing that I do with my patients living with HIV, um, unfortunately, to get the most expedited care, um, I guess this is a plug, uh, not intentionally, for uh, Methodists in Dallas, they have a program for persons living with HIV to receive renal transplant, and we seem to get that a lot faster. Hypertension. Also here, and they all go hand in hand. Hypertension worsens kidney disease, heart disease, and kidney disease. We have some new uh, names to kind of link them, cardio, renal, metabolic issues. All of this goes hand in hand. And then obesity. Obesity obviously goes along with these things, but obesity is not just being overweight. The fat cells, the adipose cells are doing things. They're making hormones. They're making bad stuff, pumping it out and making everything worse. We know that if we can reduce obesity, even if it's just by a couple of pounds, I can reverse damage in the liver. We can improve kidney function. Maybe someone needs less thyroid medicine. Cholesterol goes down. Diabetes gets better controlled. And so we have a whole host of things to address obesity in terms of medicines. I didn't put it in because I really didn't know what you would be interested in speaking about. So there questions about if there are questions about that please at any point feel free to ask uh, I guess so far where we're going with this just to, to review is that these things that we've talked about we want to uh, address them we want to address them aggressively reverse them if we can so that we all of us can live longer healthier and happier uh, this is a slide kind of going back to natural things of a recent study called the, the MIND study, which was looking at a combination of studies uh, of diets, the Mediterranean diet and something called the DASH diet. It was specifically looking at Alzheimer's rates in patients. And when people from certain areas of the world ate like this, in this quantity, where we have very, very little refined sugars, which cause lots of inflammation in the body, 
and we eat a small amount of dairy, small amount of meat, and then obviously increase. There was a 53% reduction in Alzheimer's in patients. Now, all of us are at increased risk for that as we age, uh, but there are sometimes some neurocognitive or memory problems associated with HIV, probably due to inflammation, um, probably also due to some infections that we get. Uh, one of the slides, I hope it's in here, for example, I think there's some data look at human herpes virus 6 in, in dementia and all of these different things that we come in contact that just make it worse. This, this, uh, this was the MIND, M-I-N-D. I think it's really great. One of the things that they highlighted um, that I forgot was really lean, uh, lean, leafy green vegetables. So anything in the cruciferous family, broccoli, cabbage, kale, spinach, that really seemed to drive things forward a lot. Meats do seem to increase um, inflammation as well. So whatever we can do to decrease inflammation, that is key. All of these things, inflammation is huge. So this just kind of primary care screening for older adults. What do we screen for? How do we screen? What do we do? I, I, I don't know what your physicians or your providers do. I get lots of people who come to me and, and they've never done wellness labs. And so we do wellness labs on everyone annually. Um, and so we're going to look at what, what screening can we do. So the USPSTF, which is the United States Preventive Services Task Force, is one government body that makes recommendations. Now they're all different. American College of Physicians may make a recommendation, American College of Dermatology, GI, blah, blah, blah. But this is USPSTF, so I just want to review this. Now, an A, a grade A, is that they highly recommend the service, and there's high certainty that the benefit is substantial. In a B, obviously, not quite as great. So we'll go through some of those things and you'll see to the right of the screen there will be a demarcation of an A or a B. Um, AA screen, that's abdominal aortic aneurysm. So there is a risk over time of developing aneurysms in, in the abdomen and it seems that it's limited um, the data of who can benefit to men. So you see that an ultrasound one time in men aged 65 to 75 who have ever smoked. Um, smoking is a huge risk for heart disease blockage but also weakening of these vessels and developing these, this ballooning, this dilation which we'll call an aneurysm. Um, diabetic screening, adults age 40 to 70 who are overweight or obese. Um, I do not follow this. Everyone gets screened for diabetes every year. I don't know when it's going to happen. We can look at family history. We can look at a whole host of things to try to predict. It's a cheap test. There's no reason to not do it because, as you saw from previous slides, any comorbidity that goes missed increases our risk of death and, and sickness. Um, Aspirin used to prevent coronary artery disease. They recommend a low dose aspirin uh, in individuals aged 50, 50 to 59 who have greater than 10% of developing disease. And that 10% comes from, comes from some risk calculators that your physician can do or you can look up online yourself. You put in your age, your race, your sex, uh, your blood pressure, cholesterol, and it will give you a calculation. And so if your calculation, your risk comes to 10%, recommend an aspirin. That's not something that I would recommend just doing on your own because at the same time that it causes benefit, it can cause harm in some people for whom it is not really indicated. So just keep that in mind. Uh, breast cancer screening, they recommend every two years for mammograms, age 50 to 74. I do not recommend every two years. Personally, I recommend every year. A lot can happen in two years. Last thing that you want is to miss something. Statistically, it's not significant, but you're more than a statistic. It's the way I feel. Um, where are we? Cervical cancer screening. So cervical cancer screening, very important uh, to do so in any woman uh, who has a cervix. And then I guess this jumps into the guidelines, kind of what we just said. Breast cancer screening, for me, every year. For them, every two years. And then cervical cancer screening, which are your pap smears. Um, I don't really do this top one anymore, pap smear alone. We do pap smears with human papillomavirus testing. Uh, and if you do that, it's every three years. I mean, who really wants to go 
You can do it every three years. Very, very effective, very safe. Human papillomavirus has an increased risk of cervical cancer, vulvar cancer, penile cancer, anal cancer, rectal cancer, head and neck cancers. Head and neck cancers perhaps up to 30% now due to human papillomavirus, which we really recommend getting vaccinated against. Um, in persons living with HIV, the human papillomavirus, which all of us, 89%, have been exposed to, cannot clear it very effectively, so it tends to hang around. Now, they're not all equally pr problematic. There are 12 serotypes of human papillomavirus. Uh, type 16, 18, 31, 33 goes on. Those types particularly problematic and can increase our risk of cancer. So we really want to look for these things on a regular basis. And we can roll on. Um, colorectal cancer screening. All adults age 50 to 75, colorectal cancer screening, the second part, all adults age 40 to 49. What has recently happened is we've lowered the age for colorectal cancer screening beginning at age 45 using stool-based testing. Uh, so two different ways to do stool-based testing. And then starting at age 50, we can either continue the stool-based test or if you're a particularly high risk for developing colon cancer or family history, we usually recommend um, colonoscopy, direct visualization of the colon. Fall prevention, whatever we can do to prevent falls um, is helpful. Hepatitis C screening, we screen everyone for hepatitis C um, yearly. The recommendation is usually once in a lifetime, but we do it yearly. Um, CT screening for lung cancer, I think this one is hugely important. Persons living with HIV have an increased risk of lung cancer above that, um, above that of other populations. If you're HIV and you're a smoker, your risk for developing lung cancer is above that of a person not living with HIV who also smokes. That goes back to, I think there was a point earlier about the immune system and it rebuilding. When we go through these periods of immunodeficiency, the body can't check itself and things start to happen and it increases the risk over time. So if you've ever smoked a 20 pack year history, what does that mean? So if you smoked a pack a day for 20 years, that's a 20 pack year history of smoking. If you're still smoking or you've quit, but within the last 15 years, you can do a CT scan of the chest once a year to look for cancer. If you do have lung cancer, this is definitely a huge killer. This is something we want to detect very early on, stage one, stage two, not three, not four. So one of the steps that you can take to also um, help to prevent problems. And then the osteoporosis screening in postmenopausal women 65 or if you've had an early menopause or perhaps if you take mood certain mood stabilizers which are also anti-epileptics seizure medications can um, cause some bone loss some of our medications both for the treatment as well as prevention of hiv can cause an associated bone loss trovada is is the name brand um, it does not though that medication seem to be associated with a risk of fracture if I'm correct, but it is a risk of, of bone loss. So just some things to consider. Men and women, men can also develop osteoporosis. Am I boring you to death? Okay, sorry if I am. So um, trends in causes of death in persons with HIV, looking at the time span of 1999 to 2011. Uh, and you can see they, they broke it up into those two sides of the bar graph, and we see AIDS-related deaths. Uh, I think which went back to a previous question, were they AIDS-related or not? And they've greatly decreased. They're still there, obviously. But we have a whole host of other things that we're trying to fight against. Liver-related deaths, cardiovascular-related deaths, and non-AIDS cancers, and then the, the other and unknown. So this slide, just kind of really looking at the cancers more, more specifically. I'm just going to switch sides. Looking at the cancers more specifically from the University of Colorado, looking at causes of deaths, uh, 32 cancer deaths out of the 100 total deaths. And so you can see sort of what, what was more prevalent, which ones are causing more problems. Uh, obviously, you can see lymphoma, uh, lung cancer, usually due to smoking. Liver cancers, hepatitis C, hepatitis B, especially if there's 
alcohol usage at, at the same time really increases the risk of uh, liver cancer or what we call hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, tongue cancers, which kind of goes with that head and neck cancer that I mentioned, smoking, and then human papillomavirus again, uh, anal cancers, human papillomavirus, these cancers of the, the, the what we call it, the tree in the liver, uh, these cholangiocarcinoma, cervical cancer again, to review with human papillomavirus, uh, renal cancer, the association is with smoking, uh, the larynx, also human papilloma tonsil, uh, gastric carcinoma, smoking. In some persons, there can be an increased risk of gastric carcinoma with certain bacteria. You'll see that we talked a lot about cancers in bacteria and viruses. Um, they, there's some nasty boogers, boogers, they will kill us. Um, certain countries, such as Japan, there's a, an increase in uh, consuming lots of pickled foods and smoked foods, and that too seems to have some sort of a contribution to it. Uh, colon cancer, smoking, some recent studies though looking at certain bacteria that are in the gut, one of them Fusobacterium, um, not that you wanted to know that, but there are lots of things that happen in the gut with bacteria that can affect us. There's some recent studies looking at Parkinson's disease that it actually originates in the gut and not in the brain. It sort of begins there and goes, and that's where a whole healthy diet, healthy living comes in. Uh, and then prostate, bladder, uh, glioblastoma, and astrocytoma, or um, central nervous system brain tumors. Am I going too quickly? Okay, I'm sweating. So uh, CT lung cancer, we, we've kind of discussed that one already. Uh, this is more just of a recap. I think this one is really important because it's, it's, it's recommended, it's paid for by the insurance companies. And so I, I think these things are things that we shouldn't ignore, steps that we want to take to live healthier, happier lives uh, for ourselves and, and for our family. Uh, colorectal cancer screening, again, just a, a recap of that. And then how do, how do we go about doing it? So what, what do we do to address these specific things? So lung cancer, you know, do you smoke? Do you want to stop smoking? Offering people cessation and then doing the low-dose low CT to look for it. Oral cancers, you know, just something as simple as looking in someone's mouth once a year for exams, just taking a look. And, and the same thing goes with anal cancer, prostate cancer, cervical cancer, uh, colorectal. Just taking a look if someone wants it done. Uh, doing the tests that are associated with it. Anal cancer, you can do what's called an, an anal pap smear, anal cytology. So anyone who participates in anal receptive sex, it's a, a little Q-tip. It's something that you can collect yourself to uh, preserve your privacy, modesty. It's a, a sampling, a, a, a gentle twirl, and then we just send it off for testing. Same thing, prostate cancer, we can do the blood work, we can do a rectal exam. Uh, most people some societies don't recommend continue to do the PSA, which is the blood work for screening for prostate cancer, because it's not statistically significant. Um, I diagnose people all the time, including my dad, with prostate cancer, with no family history of prostate cancer. It, it can't hurt. It's a cheap test. I just recommend doing it. Uh, we went over cervical, colorectal. Uh, melanoma can be particularly strange and unusual cancer. It can pop up in different places. Um, some people's melanomas can be in the fingernail, a black streak in the nail. It can be on the bottom of the foot. It can be around the anus, the rectum. Um, you really just want to look for these things. Melanoma, a very, very deadly cancer. We've come a long way. There's lots of immunotherapy for treatment, but definitely not a cancer that you want to have and go unchecked. Uh, and then liver cancer. Really also recommend everyone get screened for hepatitis B, hepatitis C. We have treatments for cure of hepatitis C, pretty close to 99% treatment. I've never seen a failure with my clients. Hepatitis B don't really have a way to cure it effectively in a large number of people. It does happen, but primarily what we do is to treat it, generally speaking, with medicines like, like Travada, one of the drugs in there also treats for it. 
and then we have recommendations for immunizations. Uh, everyone is different about immunizations, have their different opinions and feelings, so I just wanted to go over what do we have available to us. So just starting from the top, influenza for flu once a year, uh, tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis you'll see is the second line, uh, usually every 10 years. Uh, varicella, so that is for chickenpox, two doses. Uh, human papillomavirus, which you saw in the slides, a lot of cancers associated with human papillomavirus. Uh, the HPV vaccines, which they keep coming out with new ones, Gardasil, and they usually ends with a number as such as nine, great for preventing human papillomavirus. Um, zoster, that is to prevent shingles, which is extremely painful and can last for a very long period of time, so we really want to prevent that complication. Measles, mumps, and rubella. And then the next two are the pneumococcal vaccines to prevent pneumonia caused from pneumococcus. Um, that tends to change over time. Right now, uh, we will do an injection at the time of diagnosis with one, and then later on we do two doses, no closer than five years apart, treating before 65 and treating after the age of 65. Um, hepatitis A, hepatitis B, very, very effective vaccines for it. Um, hepatitis B, I do the two dose, which is Heplosav B, which has um, a, a better effect of actually giving someone immunity than our older vaccines, which were a series of three. The meningitis vaccine, really don't see a whole lot of meningitis quite as much as we used to. And then the last one, COVID vaccine. Um, do recommend those because COVID associated mortality in persons living with HIV is heightened. I'm sorry. Yes. For B, so, I, I, so the short answer is yes and the long answer is no. Um, so can some people be cured? Yes. Is it extremely effective, what we have available? No, it's not very effective at all. And you have to keep monitoring it and people can lose some, some things over time. I can, we can get it suppressed just like the HIV. So we can have a hepatitis B viral load in the millions or whatever, and we can push it down to being undetectable. So same, same principle. Not everyone can be cured though. Same thing as, as HIV. Some people have been cured, yes. Is that approach broadly applicable to everyone? No, no, unfortunately not. Yes. Uh, I'm scheduled for, a, I have an aortic aneurysm. Yes. And I have HIV. Yes. What could you tell me how to, what to expect and to, what to do with my recovery? What to do for, what was the last part? How can I utilize my recovery with the healing process? I, I guess it depends upon the approach of, of how they do it. There are a lot of different... Well, I, so, that, so it's way, way outside of what I do. So I don't know about current techniques and methods. I do know that there are ways to do uh, endoscopic repairs or things done inside of the arteries as opposed to opening people up. Um, Oh, c'est on allé. Sorry, <laughs> I'm heading into my thing. So it just depends upon how they how they do it in the approach. It can be a short recovery or a bit of a longer recovery, depending. You want to see what we have? See what we have left. Sorry, uh, immunization. We've kind of been over that. COVID. It's important. Summary, we went through that. So I just wanted to speed through since we only have five minutes because I really, I apologize for talking so long because I really didn't want to talk at all. I, I wanted to hear more questions. So I really want to answer anything that you have. Yes. <laughs> okay, some cholesterol medicine that you take can give you uh, j uh, joint pains and everything. I had uh, some that I took and it gave me joint pains and my doctor took me off of it. So what's the next, because I was on a sympathetic or whatever you call it. Sympathetic. Yeah. So, so some statins do seem to carry a higher risk or a lower risk of muscle pain. Largely, they probably don't cause as much muscle pain as we think. I'm not saying you didn't. They do cause muscle pain. 
Um, there was a study that I wanted to talk about, but we have five minutes. So there are some injectable forms, for example, Rapatha. Rapatha is a great one to decrease the risk of complications of coronary artery disease. Uh, there is another one that its name is slipping my mind right now. If anyone else remembers, anyway, they're busy. Um, that one is one. So we usually do that. Zetia is another one. It's not a statin. It does not seem to be quite as effective, though, for decreasing the complications of coronary artery disease. But the bottom line is we have lots of things that we can explore for you, whether it's the, the newer injectables, which don't cause that muscle pain, if that answers your question. OK. OK. I'm going to say in the microphone, uh, I think one question was if statins are safe in people with kidney disease. Absolutely, extremely safe in persons with kidney disease. Um, what some people fear is that are they safe in liver disease, and they are absolutely safe in liver disease. You do want to watch it closely. So the statin is working on the liver, and so some people do have some fear about, it, especially for example, patients with autoimmune hepatitis. Uh, they can still take statins. Very, very, very safe and effective, especially in kidney disease. And actually, one of the recommendations for persons with chronic kidney disease is to have them on statins because you do want to target cholesterol to improve outcomes. So it is one of the things that persons with kidney disease should be on. Yes. So my, my question is global. Like I have a doctor, she's good, and she's been doing the same screenings. I'm now 65. She's been doing the same screenings. Should I be asking her, are there other types of screenings? Should I be taking this information to her? Because <laughs> yes. I don't know if she's doing everything Right. because I'm now transitioned to another age group. Absolutely. I think the short answer is yes. I the, the the client, I like to call patients clients because, you know, you can fire me at any time. You're paying me to know, you're paying me to do, and if I'm not doing, you better go find somebody else. And I'm not saying that person is doing that. What I'm saying is I like to educate and I like my patient or client to be educated so that we're on the same page and I love the questions. And so you don't really know what you're supposed to be getting if you're not informed. And so I do recommend patients to be as, as informed as you can because not everyone feels comfortable. Not all cardiologists know that HIV increases the risk of coronary artery disease. Not all cardiologists, I can tell you, most in my area are not doing calcium scores. I can tell you that most cardiologists or certain specialists, um, specific types of cholesterol monitoring, apolipoprotein A, apolipoprotein B. Uh, we have cardiac risk markers, uh, C-reactive protein that's cardiac specific. I don't mean to go on and on, but yes, there's lots and lots of things. Yes. Say again. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can barely talk, much less write, so I don't, someone else have to do that for me. The next question, um, it's kind of two questions. Uh, the role of inflammation and checking for inflammation while checking cholesterol and how that kind of plays together, but also insulin resistance. I think the main question is like checking fasting insulin, checking for inflammatory markers, and that role in cholesterol. Yes, all of those are part and parcel. They all go hand in hand, and they all go start with obesity and family history. And so I do it. I do it in everyone. So, for example, the question was with respect to, I think, C-reactive protein, a cardiac-specific C-reactive protein, which measures inflammation in the heart. I like to get it in all of my persons who are in on PrEP so I can know what they are before they're positive, if they do become positive, because unfortunately sometimes that happens. And then I can have our baseline, where are we? And then we get the C-reactive protein, that's the inflammatory marker. And then what have you dropped down to after the cholesterol drug? Because the cholesterol drug, if I didn't mention it, shame on me, it's also anti-inflammatory. Oh, sorry, I was just five minutes and I'm trying to get it all out, so I'm stuck. It's a razor's edge. I think there's one more. Um, a patient says that they were diagnosed with osteoporosis at age 45, and they were told it was due to Truvada. If you had any comments on it, <clears throat> I, 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 I don't know that I've ever seen, and maybe and if time is up. I think it's highly unlikely that it progressed that far. Usually, it's an osteopenia. It is reversible though when you stop Truvada. Sorry. So um, unfortunately, our time is up, but I want to thank Dr. Landry. And uh, Jason.
Uh, it was a great session, and um, thank you for being so engaged and for your questions, really thoughtful. Um, and so we're going to take five minutes to transition to our next breakouts.